Okay, kids. Oh, I get to sit down for this one because we're on the lower level here. Welcome to MP Vinyl episode three. One, two, three. Uh, well, quick disclaimer like I did on the others, if, in case this is the first one you're watching. Uh, we got eight rows. This is new vinyl. Uh, I have this. I have literally hundreds and hundreds of old vinyl from the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Uh, but I'm just basically in this series going through my new vinyl reissues, things that came out like in the last decade or so. You know, through the uh, the resurgence of vinyl. So these are all kind of new reissues. So just because you're not seeing. Any favorites of yours doesn't mean I don't have it. I may have the old original vinyl. I may have the CD. I may have the 8-track. Uh, but but the, for the purposes of this series, we're just doing new vinyl. So, without any further ado, we are in episode 3. We are starting with F. You can see what we're starting with. And this row goes F to L. Okay. And uh, I realized in the last video, uh, anytime I would pull out the record to talk about it, you would see what's coming up next. I don't think there's any way for me to avoid giving you the sneak preview of what's um, on deck. So I guess you gotta kind of just ignore it and stay with me with what I'm talking about. So here we go. Uh, you could see here, we're starting with Flying Colors. And I guess like I did with Dream Theater, um, I'll just quickly tell you a little about the making of each record. First Flying Colors album. This was one of the first things I did uh, post Dream Theater. Uh, this was something that uh, Bill Evans was trying to put together with Steve Morse and Neil Morse. And eventually Neil brought me on board and Steve brought Dave on board and I brought Casey on board. And here we go, the first Flying Colors album. For me, this was um, uh, really exciting because uh, I'd worked with Neil in a million things, obviously, and I worked with Dave already. Uh, we toured together with G3 and we also did my uh, Zeppelin tribute band, Hammer of the Gods. So this was most exciting for me to get to work with Steve and Casey for the first time. Obviously, I've been a Steve Morse fan forever. Loved the Dixie Dregs, loved the Steve Morse band, loved when he was in Kansas and with Deep Purple. Uh, but get, to get to work with him and play with him and write with him was really exciting. And Casey was like this unknown uh, like pop kind of alternative singer that I was a fan of because I was a big fan of Endosheen and Alpharev. And I always wanted to work with him, but he was pretty much unknown when, when I gave him the call for this, and he just knocked it out of the park. Just the perfect voice and front man for this band. You know, the whole, whole idea was to take dr Team Dregs and Team Transatlantic and put us together with Casey, and uh, Peter Collins produced this album. Actually, it's one of the few albums of uh, the last two decades or so that I've worked with an outside producer. I, very, very few other albums, but we worked with Peter Collins for the making of the first record, uh, and it was mixed by uh, Michael Brower, who did uh, Dream Theater's Octavarium. I just knew that he would give it a really good, clean, uh, kind of alternative, modern mix. Anyway, first album was great. After the first album, we did a handful of shows um, in Europe, uh, well, a handful of shows uh, in the States and in Europe. First live album uh, was recorded at the uh, 013 in Tilburg, Holland, where Neil and I have done so many recordings. But uh, I have to say, uh, really, props go to Bill Evans for the packaging and the layouts, and also to Mascot as well. Uh, all the live things have really, really great layouts and artwork and colored vinyl, so really great job. Over, over the top, uh, you know, for a live album. Not always live albums get that kind of... Um, packaging. Second Nature was the second album a few years later. We did this in, I think, 2013 or 14. Uh, second album, self-produced this time. Uh, we felt like we didn't really need a referee. We already had, had enough chefs in the kitchen as it was. So we made this ourselves. And uh, because we didn't have a producer, Peter was trying to streamline the songs a bit for the first album. This time around, we kind of just let the songs be what they wanted to be. So they ended up being a little longer, Open Up Your Eyes, uh, Cosmic Symphony, two that come to mind, the first and last song on the album. But great, great stuff on here. I love this album. I love Mask Machine. I love uh, The Fury of Your Love and The Place in, uh, Place in This World. Great, great band. Great album. The second uh, live album, Second Flight, live at the Z7, recorded at the Z7 in Switzerland. Once again, great packaging um, and a great souvenir from the second tour. And then it took about five years before we got to album number three. And here we are, Third Degree, finally came out. 
uh, last year, 2019, but it took many years to make. We wrote, um, I think, oh, I don't know, seven songs or so at Steve's house uh, in 2019. 17 I think I'm losing track now or maybe 16 even and then it took a few years before we got back together to write the remaining songs But in any case, I love this album once again love this band um, And so many great tracks on here. I love crawl. I love um, uh, Last train home and, and love letter Oh, love letter was so much fun to do and uh, more and cadence I mean, great great stuff. I love this band and um this is, I guess, one of the, one is colored vinyl, one is black vinyl. And next, <laughs> coming soon, there'll be the third live album uh, recorded live in London uh, this past December. I'm putting the final touches on the packaging and the everything now, so I'll have that added to the collection soon. So there we go, Flying Colors. Uh, next in line here, the Foo Fighters. Uh, once again, I have all their stuff. I have all their albums on CD and iTunes. Uh, so just the newer stuff on the newer reissues. This was the soundtrack for the HBO series uh, that they did. Uh, what was the name of it again? Sonic Highways, which was incredibly cool. Every episode they were in a different city and they wrote a song that had to do with the city. Uh, and you actually saw them write the song from start to finish in each episode. Some great, great songs came of that. I have so much respect for Dave Grohl. Um, obviously, I mean, <laughs> you know, lead singer and, and guitar player and writer for Foo Fighters, but obviously he was the drummer in Nirvana as well, and he's done Queens of Stone Age, and, and I love Taylor Hawkins as well. Taylor is such an amazing drummer. So I love the Foo Fighters. I think they deserve to be as big as they are. Uh, they're one of the few cases where, uh, you know, they are so commercial and so famous and popular, but they really deserve it, because I think they're true artists, and Dave is a great musician. And here's the, the latest album here, uh, concrete and gold. One of my favorite things on here is there's one song where um, Paul McCartney plays drums on the track. Which track is it? It's uh, uh, putting on this, being put on the spot here. I think it might be Sunday Rain. I think could be wrong. But anyway, Paul McCartney. You get Paul McCartney to play drums on your album. <laughs> Here's a funny thing about Dave Grohl. Uh, really funny. Really quick. Um, uh, I, I met him for the first time. I don't know. 10 years ago, 12 years ago, uh, and I brought him one of each DVD of my tribute bands, Led Zeppelin, uh, Beatles, The Who, and Rush. I did four tribute bands with Paul Gilbert. I brought uh, Dave uh, copies of each one, each of them. Within the next year or two, he played with every one of those people. He played with Paul McCartney. He played with Jimmy Page and Robert Plant. He played with Pete Townsend and, and Roger Daltrey. He played with Rush at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. So was, he was probably like, uh, that's really cute, Portnoy, but step aside, I'm going to actually play with all of these guys, okay? You could pretend to be them. I'm going to play with them. So, anyway, Dave, I love you. Taylor, I love you. Love the Foo Fighters. Okay, speaking of G3, I just mentioned this a minute ago. This was um, one of the first times that I had played with Dave LaRue. It was playing in John Petrucci's band, and um, we did many, many G3 tours through the years. The first one we did was 2001 in America, which was this lineup, John, Steve Vai, Joe Satriani, and John's band was me and Dave LaRue. Uh, and then through the years, we, we went to Europe, we went to Australia, we went to Japan, and this was uh, recorded in Japan. Uh, but I did many tours with, with, uh, with these guys through the years, and uh, it wasn't always Steve, it was always Joe, but uh, we did one with Eric Johnson, we did one with Paul Gilbert. But in any case, I always had fun playing with John and, um, you know, like I've said elsewhere, sometimes I love just being the drummer. And at this time, you know, John and I were obviously working together in Dream Theater for 20 something years together. I was really honored that he still wanted to, you know, share the stage with me on his solo thing. He could have easily just wanted the spotlight to himself, but the fact that he asked me to do it was, was really sweet of him. And uh, I guess maybe because I asked, I invited him to do Liquid Tension, so maybe he invited me to do this uh, G3 stuff with him. Uh, in return, but I don't know. In, in any case, it was always fun. Um, and, you know, the, the, not only John is obviously a, a, a guitar hero, one of the greatest in the world, but Steve Vai, Joe Satriani, I mean, it was just so much talent each and every night on stage. And Billy Sheehan was playing in Steve's band at the time, Dave LaRue, oh, Dave, no, uh, Matt Bissonette was playing with, with Joe, and uh, who ended up being in uh, Yellow Matter Custard with me, and then later on, Stu Ham. So, anyway. It's always so many great musicians on this tour. Tony McAlpine was in Steve's band as well. So it was just what a what a crew of 
musicians traveling the world together. Okay, this next chunk here is from the Genesis box set. Uh, so I'll just quickly, you know, give, give it's to me these are these are the quintessential, you know, early Gabriel era albums. Trespass, which I believe is their second album, uh, but you know it has the knife on it. Nursery Crime. I hold these at the same time. Nursery Crime. I mean, so amazing. What is uh, uh, this? Is Nursery Crime has um, uh, the Return of the Giant Hogweed, which we covered with Transatlantic. And also, if you look at this artwork, this is the same guy that did the the inner artwork for Neil Morse Band's Similitude, but we'll get into that uh, on one of the up, next up and coming episodes. Uh, so anyway, Foxtrot is probably my favorite. I don't know. It's a toss between these three. Uh, I think Foxtrot might be my favorite. I mean, I love Supper's Ready. I love Watcher of the Skies. Uh, but then again, Sailing England has... has uh, uh, Firth of Fifth, which is one of my all-time favorites, and uh, s Cinema Show, I mean, it's tough. It's tough to choose. But anyway, we did a lot of, uh, Transatlantic has done a lot of Genesis, too, because we did Watcher of the Skies, Firth of Fifth, uh, Return of the Giant Hogweed, and then this was Gabriel's last album with the man, uh, legendary album, Lamb Lies Down, and, and also some of my favorite stuff on here, Flying the Windshield, uh, back in New York City, in the cage. I love in the cage and uh, Slipper Men. I mean, just so many great songs on here. So many. These really, these five are absolute classics, and I'm sure you know them. But if you don't know them, this is where prog began. As far as I'm concerned, it was Genesis. Yes, King Crimson, ELP. Um, but Gen these are the albums. This is mandatory prog if you don't have these. And then we skip ahead a few decades to modern stuff, and this is Ghost. Uh, Ghost or hit or miss for me, but this particular album, uh, uh, Meloria, is that how you say it? Yeah, this is my favorite Ghost album. I think this one has all of the elements I really like about them. And, and like I said, they're hit or miss for me. They've done some stuff that was really poppy and I just can't understand why they're so embraced by, you know, the death metal world, whatever. You know, they look, it looks like this would sound like Slayer or Opeth or, you know, Merciful Fate, but you put it on and it's, you know, sometimes they're, they could be very poppy or very straight ahead, like Blue Oyster Cult or something like that. So, uh, hit or miss for me, but this is my favorite album of theirs. And if I like it, if I really like an album, I'll usually start by buying it on iTunes. And then if, if it's something I really like, then I'm going to buy the vinyl so I could chill out and listen to it on vinyl. And this made the cut. And actually, speaking of the Lamb Lies down on Broadway, this is Kevin Gilbert. And I should have mentioned this earlier, but Kevin Gilbert uh, covered most of the Lamb Lies Down on Broadway album uh, with his old band Giraffe. And Kevin Gilbert, if you don't know, uh, is one of my biggest heroes in the prog universe, but he was a resident true prog guy. But uh, he started, you know, uh, I, I discovered him for the first time with Toy Matinee, his band, uh, around 1990 or so, and loved the Toy Matinee album, one of my favorite, like, kind of pop albums of all time. And then uh, then he did a few solo albums, and this is Thud. Uh, this this was, I think, his first full-length solo album, and so much great stuff on here. Nick DiVirgilio plays on here, and uh, this was before I knew Nick, and Dave Kersner and, and Rush, Rush Paris, uh, Toss Panos, I mean, there's so many great songs in here. My favorite song is uh, Shadow Self, which is very, very Peter Gabriel, very proggy, but every song on here is great. Uh, the Tears of Audrey and Goodness Gracious and Waiting. I, it's just, he was so talented. We tragically lost him uh, around uh, 97, I think it was. And I was actually talking to him at the time about possibly producing uh, Dream Theater's Falling Into Infinity. We were writing for that album at that time and looking for a producer and I was talking with Kevin in the, the weeks before he passed away about possibly producing Falling Into Infinity. And I've often said this, if, if Kevin hadn't uh, tragically died and passed away, I have a feeling, uh, whether or not it worked out with Dream Theater and Falling Into Infinity, I have a feeling he would have been my first call for Transatlantic. Uh, with all due respect to Royna, but uh, you know when I was putting together Transatlantic with Neil, I think if Kevin was still around, I would have absolutely wanted and invited him to possibly, you know, be a part of it with us if he was interested. So imagine what that would have been. And after this, he put out Shaming of the True, which I really do need on vinyl. I, I have to get that. So the Shaming of the True was his concept album that he was working on when he passed away, and an absolute masterpiece. And Nick DiVirgilio 
finished it after he passed. Anyway, Kevin Gilbert, what an amazing artist. You've got to get familiar with him if you're not already. This is really interesting. Um, this is Sean Lennon's uh, band, uh, The Ghost of a Sabretooth Tiger. Uh, love this album. And this might be one of my favorite Beatles albums, Beatles-related albums not done by a Beatle. Um, it, I just really love the psychedelic vibe on here. He almost picks up where like Magical Mystery Tour left off and takes it to you know a new generation and uh, really, really love this album. He did great, great work. And my dream, my dream band, I have always said this, but might as well say it here. I would, I would do anything to see a band with Sean Lennon, um, Zach Starkey on drums, Danny Harrison on guitar, and uh, James McCartney on guitar, just to see the four of them together. And they'd have to call the band Here Comes the Sun, S-O-N. But to see, I mean, it's a natural to see Sean and to see the four kids of the Beatles play together or write together or perform together would be the biggest dream come true for me. I think that's an intriguing thing. Please make it happen in my lifetime. Okay, uh, speaking of early Genesis, here's Steve Hackett and uh, a bunch of Steve Hackett stuff. I get these sent to me from inside out. Thank you, Thomas Wabber and Freddie. Uh, but Steve, I love what Steve has been doing with the Genesis catalog. I mean, he's really, he really has been feeding the fan base. So obviously everybody, wants a Genesis reunion with Steve and Peter Gabriel. And it just, for whatever reason, doesn't seem to be happening. So this is as close as you're gonna get these days to hearing this early Genesis stuff done by anybody from Genesis. Uh, you know, I think Phil Phil Collins, Tony Banks, and uh, Mike, Mike Rutherford are gonna be back together again, or at least they were supposed to before the pandemic hit. And you know, they're, they'll touch on some of this old stuff, but of course they they do more of the, the Phil Collins saying stuff. So Steve Hackett has just been really great with feeding the fans, doing these, these early songs and doing these tours. Always a great band. Uh, Jonas Reingold plays bass. Uh, Royna Stolt did a tour playing bass. Um, I think Marco Miniman did some shows and, and Craig Blundell is just great, great musicians always surrounding him, playing all the best Genesis stuff. Here we go into Hakenland, and um, well, what can I say? I've said it before, I've said it elsewhere. They are my band of the last decade. I mean, look at this. And this was all released between 2010 and 2020. Uh, they have a brand new album that's supposed to be coming out soon. I don't have it on vinyl yet, but I've been loving uh, the, the iTunes version I have that they sent me. But Look at this. I mean, what what a, a string of albums. Um, they are one of my favorite new prog bands out there. Um, they they remind me a lot of, you know, early Dream Theater. You could hear that influence in them. But I think they really have picked up, uh, you know, picked up the the flag or the candle, whatever whatever that expression is. They've picked it up and they've, they've kind of, fl they're now carrying the flag of that kind of stuff, uh, you know, for the next uh, decade. And uh, obviously, uh, such great musicians, and so so great that I invited them to be my backup band when I did the Shattered Fortress tour in 2017, and they absolutely killed it. Uh, everybody in the band, except for Ray, the drummer, obviously, but uh, Ray was kind enough to loan me his band, and Charlie, and Ross, and Richard, and Diego, and Connor. Uh, I mean, they were just all so great, and such great musicians, and honored to be friends with them at this point. Oh, and I make a... Uh, did I mention that I said Ross, Charlie, Richard, Diego, Connor? Yeah, I got them all. <laughs> Make sure I didn't leave anybody out. My favorite of all these might be the Mountain or or uh, Vector or even the new one. But uh, I should mention that I actually played Gong on this, so I actually made a guest appearance on this one. Okay. Uh, oh God, look what's next. Uh, one of my all-time favorites. One of the greats of all time. George Harrison's All Things Must Pass. Uh, I love the early Solo Beatles albums, and um, this, I think, is one of the best of them. I, I, I love Plastic Ono Band, Image, uh, Ima Imagine. I love Ram and Band on the Run, um, but I think this is just as good as, as those, if not even better. I think George obviously was just, had so much material piling up for all those years, and a lot of this, you know, a lot of the songs on here were fiddled around on the, uh, you know, the Get Back Sessions or the Abbey Road Sessions, and they just didn't get used by the Beatles. So there's so many greats on here. Um, what is Life is so amazing. Covered that with, with Neil and Randy. Um, uh, of course, My Sweet Lord, Isn't It a Pity, Beware of Darkness, before Spock's Beard did it. 
Um, it's Johnny's birthday. There's a song on side five called It's Johnny's Birthday, which I play to John Petrucci every single year for his birthday. I'll either call him and play it or email it to him. Uh, but in any case, and there you can see the Red Apple Records. And uh, Ringo plays on this. Alan White plays drums on this. Uh, I mean, Billy Preston, Gary Wright, Gary Brooker, the, the guys from Badfinger. I mean, it's just a masterpiece. And of course, this is like a reissue of the original. I still have my original 70s version in my old collection, but I had to buy a new one as well. And I, luckily, they reproduced the packaging exactly like the original. Uh, this next one is another uh, Inside Out album, and it's Headspace, and it's a great, great album in the vein of uh, maybe maybe Haken a little bit, or maybe a little bit more like Symphony X. And anyway, really, really cool stuff, and uh, definitely recommend it. And uh, here we go. Heaven and Hell, which is basically Black Sabbath uh, with Dio, but they weren't allowed to call themselves Black Sabbath. This was, uh, I think this was recorded at Radio City Music Hall, if I'm correct. Um, but this is, oh no, no, I'm sorry, this isn't the live album. I'm sorry, this was the last studio album. Um, my bad. Um, in any case, it was so great for, uh, for them to get back together those final years before Ronnie passed away. And uh, I saw them uh, with this lineup several times. Uh, did some festivals with them while they were doing this, and and Dio was just amazing, just so amazing to to be singing the way he did at the age he was at, and the loudest stage volume I've ever heard. These guys, Geezer and and Tony Iommi's guitars and bass were so loud, and they're they're using wedges like old schools, and Dio is singing over that volume. It was just incredible, really impressive. Uh, so there you go, and we're rounding here into Hendrix land. But this is the only one I have in a new issue. I, obviously, I love Are You Experience. I love Access Bold as Love. I should probably add those to the collection as well. But the only one I have in a new reissue is Electric Ladyland. This is obviously one of his masterpieces. It was his double album and so many great songs on here. Uh, but it's deep cuts. It's not like all, you know, Are You Experience is a lot of the, the, the singles, whereas this got a little deeper, a lot more jamming. I love the deeper cuts like Burning in the Midnight. Burning of the Midnight Lamp, and uh, 1983, and, and Still Raining, Still Dreaming. These are all so cool. Uh, yeah, great, great Hendrix album. And I worked in Electric Ladyland. Um, we mixed Scenes for a Memory there, and we mixed the first Flying Colors album there. So it was amazing to work in the leg legendary studio that Jimmy built. Uh, the first Jane's Addiction album, and I really should have Ritual of the Aloha Ritual as well. I really should have the first and the second, but this was a huge album for me. I haven't even opened it yet, but this is on clear vinyl. Uh, I have the original vinyl from the 80s, because this was a huge album when it came out for me. Uh, and the guys in Dream Theater, we, everybody, we all loved this album when it came out. I think it was around 87 or 88. Um, Kevin Moore was a big fan of this album as well. and. Uh, we used to jam on a lot of these songs, like uh, Pigs and Zen and, uh, you know, Ted Just Admit It, Up the Beach, Ocean Size. Oh, I saw Jane's, I guess it must have been the first time they played New York because they were an L.A. band. And I saw them on this tour uh, when they played New York. And I felt like I was seeing The Doors in 1967. I was just absolutely blown away by the musicality, by how daring they were. Uh, I remember uh, at one point, um, uh, Dave Navarro and Perry Farrell making out on stage, and I was like, oh my God, this is like the craziest thing I've ever seen. And I remember thinking Perry Farrell was totally like the new generation's version of Jim Morrison, and I was convinced he wasn't gonna make it through the, the decade. And here we are, you know, three decades later, you know, 30 years later or whatever, and uh, he's still doing great and healthy as, healthy and you know looking great and sounding great so god bless him and god bless all of them love stephen perkins drumming he's so great and i love the second album just as much as the first i need to get that on vinyl as well okay here's a couple of really big ones for me <laughs> these are huge albums for me these two well there's four here two of them are legitimate albums and then two are kind of uh you know post breakup kind of compilations but this is jellyfish Belly Button and Spilt Milk. Two of my favorite albums of all time. Spilt Milk being in my top 10 of all time. Absolute, I mean, they're both amazing. To me, this is like Rubber Soul and Revolver. I mean, this was like, you know, Belly Button was all just amazing songs, great songs, great textures, kind of like Rubber Soul. 
and then they went to the next level. Actually, it's, it's almost like Revolver and Sgt. Pepper, actually, to be a little bit more accurate, because you have the, the songs, and you really could, they're scratching the surface with Belly Button, but with Spilt Milk, this is their Sgt. Pepper. And the, the, the production and the instrumentation, what, the first time I heard this, it was like, this is all my favorite bands in a melting pot. I said that about Big Elf uh, in a previous episode. It was the same with Jellyfish. When I heard Spilt Milk, it was like, oh my God, this is the Beatles and the Beach Boys and Super Tramp and, and Queen and all these amazing sounds and harmonies and, ugh. And, uh, you know, this past year, I, I had a chance to record a track off a of belly button. I did I Want to Stay Home with, uh, with Roger Manning and Jason Faulkner, uh, who's, there's Roger. Uh, there's Roger, there's Jason, and to actually uh, have done something with both of those guys was a bucket list thing for me that I always wanted to work with, with those guys. So to, to have done uh, I Want to Stay Home with the two of them this past year was a dream come true. And then beyond the, the two, they only made two albums and then they broke up in 93 or 4 after Spilt Milk, but then these have been put out since then. It's a live album from Bogarts, which has uh, some great covers on there, Let Em In by Wings and... Um, uh, Hold Your Head Up by Argent, so really cool stuff in there. And then this is Radio Jellyfish, which is more like radio broadcast stuff, uh, acoustics, things like that. So if you don't know Jellyfish, <laughs> I'm jealous that you're going to be able to experience these for the first time, because prepare to have your mind blown. Then uh, the only Jethro Tull, I have a new vinyl. Once again, I have all the stuff in my old vinyl, but this is my favorite Tull album. This and Thick as a Brick, my two favorite Tull albums, so I probably got to get Thick as a Brick as well. The new reissue but this was um i think this was the new version uh the anniversary version that might have been remixed by uh by stephen wilson i i'm pretty sure he did at least the cd box set and um in any case uh one of my favorite albums of all time uh just recently uh covered him 43 with neil and randy and uh so many great songs locomotive breath cross-eyed mary aqualung i mean great great classic album and uh, was this Barrymore Barlow? Uh, uh, ma, 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 ma. No, this was Clyde Bunker still. And then Barrymore Barlow came in thick as a brick, and he was a, a real early favorite prog drummer of mine. Uh, and then the Bursting Out Live album that they did. I loved that album that came out. All right, here we are in the Crimson section, and uh, not as many Crimson vinyls in here as you would think. But once again, I hate to keep repeating myself, I have them all elsewhere. These are just the new reissues. And basically, I only have um, two of my three favorites. My three favorite Crimson albums are Court of Crimson King, Red, and Discipline. They're kind of three different eras, the 60s, 70s, and 80s. I don't have Discipline on new reissue, but this is, um, I mean, what, that's just one of the most iconic album covers ever. Every song on here is just perfect. Uh, I get goosebumps just even looking at this uh but you know the hearing uh the court of the crimson king the the mellotron and the 21st century schizoid man epitaph i've been by the way i've been egging michael ackerfeld on for years to cover epitaph i could totally picture him singing that but in any case i got uh the, the, the normal reissue and then i got the picture disc as well and then here's red um god what one of my favorite prog albums of all time just the trio, well, although they're actually on the album as well, they have uh, David Cross and Mel Collins and uh, Ian McDonald, but the, the core band, Robert Fripp, Bill Bruford, and John Wetton, what a band. And um, this has probably one of my favorite songs of all time, Starless, the song Starless, is just an absolute masterpiece. And uh, I covered that with Neil and Randy, which was almost sacrilegious to try it, but I'm real proud of what we ended up doing. And we also just recently covered One More Red Nightmare as well. But what an album. And, uh, you know, I, I can't say enough about Bruford's drumming and the influence he had on me, not only with Crimson, but Yes and UK and stuff like that as well. And then John Wetton is, is playing and his voice, his bass playing, tremendously overlooked. I mean, that, that middle section to Starless is just incredible. Everyone always thinks of Wetton's voice, but he was a great play, player as well. And Robert Fripp, of course, you know, the genius behind it all. So, yeah, but I do need to get more Crimson in my collection. And then here's the other King, from King Crimson to King Diamond. And um, here we go. This is basically, you know, I'm missing, I, I, I probably should have Conspiracy in here as well. The only ones I have are Fatal Portrait, which was his first solo album, 
Abigail, one of my favorite metal albums of the 80s, and I even had a cat named Abigail, named after this album. And then came Them, which I, I didn't think anything could top Abigail, and then Them took it to the next level. Uh, the production at the time, too, was oh, so crisp and so heavy. I, I, I love these albums. And I know King's voice is a bit of an acquired taste for a lot of people, um, but if you can get past that, the musicianship in this band, I mean, Mickey D's drumming on these albums are in, just incredible, huge influence for me back around 86, 87, 88 when these came out. I mean, I played these albums to death. And like I said, the, uh, the sequel to them is Conspiracy, which I don't have here, but I do have the eye. But I definitely need to add Conspiracy to, to be complete. Uh, but yeah, Andy LaRock on guitar. I mean, this is just some amazing stuff. Um, so if you can get past the vocals, I mean, if you like the vocals, then, then great, you're gonna be in heaven. But if you can get past the vocals and just listen to the riffs and the playing, what a band they were. All right, this next chunk, and it's a big chunk, because I had to have all the classics reissued. Yes, I still to this day am a Kiss freak and a Kiss fanatic. Um, you know, I just, I mean, just look at that. It, this just brings me back to my childhood. This is like my childhood. I grew up with these albums. Um, I have all the original ones in my collection still, but uh, I had to rebuy the whole collection of all the early 70s stuff. And every one of these albums, I mean, I have them on 8-track as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, th this was my childhood, you know, around 75, 76, 77, 78. Um, you know, th they were my biggest heroes. I was the biggest Kiss fanatic you could meet. I started with the Beatles, you know, late 60s, early 70s. The Beatles were, I, that was my thing. I was fanatical about them. But then, you know, once I was around nine, 10 years old or whatever, Kiss was like the new Beatles to me. And there, there are a lot of parallels between the Beatles and Kiss, believe it or not. Um, you know, I, I always pictured Paul Stanley as like the Paul McCartney um, stereotype. Gene is like the John Lennon stereotype. Ace is the George Harrison and, and Peter is the Ringo. So I think there was a lot of similarities between Kiss and the Beatles when they came around. And here, like the Beatles, you had four very distinctive personalities you know, it was like four superstars, super, four superheroes in the, in the same band. So very similar concept to the Beatles, but this was, you know, for a 10 year old kid in the seventies, it was magical. Um, but you know, I'll go through them all quick. First Kiss album, legendary, so many great songs, Strutter, Deuce. Um, you know, the production was not so great. Production, I think, was even worse on Hotter Than Hell. The mix is really hard to listen to, but so many great songs. Uh, I love All The Way. I still want to cover that one these days, but Watching You and and uh, Going Blind, Got To Choose, Parasite. Ugh. And this, I think, is my early, this is my favorite of the first three. I love Dress To Kill. I love the deep cuts. I love Room Service and, and uh, uh, Getaway, Love Her All I Can, Anything For My Baby, Come On And Love Me. I mean, it's just song after song after song. Then this was the big one, and I actually have uh, my old Alive hanging on the wall signed by all four of them uh, through the years. But this is, I rebought uh, the reissue, and you know, comes with all the same stuff and the booklets and everything from the original. Uh, but one of the great live albums of all time, which probably wasn't even recorded live, but it doesn't matter. This captured everything about the band that was great and all the best songs from the first three albums. Destroyer. Uh, probably their masterpiece of this era. Not my favorite, but probably the masterpiece. Produced by Bob Ezrin, who went on to do The Wall. Uh, of course, Detroit Rock City. I love Do You Love Me. Uh, I love King of the Nighttime World. Uh, you know, Beth is on here, God of Thunder, Shout It Out Loud. So, you know, a little bit of everything, something for everyone on this album. And then this is probably my favorite of the middle three. I, I would say, um, Dress to Kill is my favorite of the first three. This is my favorite of the, the next three. Love Rock and Roll Over. I think it's one of the best sounding of the old Kiss albums. And once again, I love the, the deep cuts. I love Take Me. I've always wanted to cover Take Me. I Want You, uh, Mr. Speed, Ladies Room, Calling Calling Dr. Love. That's a that's like, what a, what a song. That came up on my iTunes uh, shuffle uh, a few months ago. And I was like, what a perfect, perfect song. Amazing. Uh, Love Gun, this was the tour that I saw them on for the first time, and then actually, I saw them in December 77, so it was, they were still touring on Love Gun, but I think Alive 2 had just come out, and that's the first time I saw them, Madison Square Garden, December 14th, 77, so basically, this was the show I saw, first time I saw Kiss, and I remember they opened with I Stole Your Love, 
oh, it was just amazing to be in that room, even before the show started, to just see the KISS logo, uh, you know, on stage, all in metallic, but not lit up yet, and to smell the pot smoke in the room, and it was just magical, incredible, and, you know, that was like one of those Beatle Ed Sullivan moments for me. Uh, when I was a kid, and I taped it. I brought it. I snuck in a tape recorder and taped it, uh, and I have a bootleg of it somewhere on cassette still to this day. And then, this is like one of the most hated albums in their catalog, especially by like Gene and Paul. I love this album. I think this is an, an incredibly underrated album. Uh, I know you know they looked corny at the time, and you know all the you know we had grown up. I guess you know when I fell in love with this Kiss. By the time this came out. I was moving on to other things and listening to stuff like Motorhead and ACDC and, you know, so my taste was changing and they, you know, all of their young kids were growing up, so starting to move on to different things. But looking back now, I think this was a great album. I love the songs on here. It's Eric Carr on drums. I love uh, Odyssey, which is another song I've been wanting to cover forever. But I think there's great stuff on here. Um, World Without Heroes is beautiful. Uh, Only You, I mean, great stuff. So I'm still an Elder fan. All right, we are getting towards the end here. We only have a few left. Oh wait, can't forget this. There's a box set stuck here in the middle. Uh, this is the four solo albums. And I remember buying these when they came out, the day they came out in 1978. Uh, here's the story, I went, and bought, I went and bought all four of these the day they came out in 78. And then about a week later, uh, somebody stole them from my school locker. Why I had them in my school locker, I'll never remember. But So I ended up having to go and buy them again. But when I went back and rebought them, I did buy Peter's. I wasn't a fan of Peter. I mean, Peter's my hero. I love him. I love you, Peter. But the album was just like country rock and stuff. It just wasn't my thing. Um, obviously, everybody always talks about Ace's album being the best. I think I may have to agree. I mean, I love... Uh, rip it out. I mean, Anton Fix drumming on that is amazing. But I love speeding back to my baby and Snowblind and uh, wipe down. I'm in need of love. Ugh. But I love Pauls and Jeans too. I mean, everybody so talks about how great Pauls is as well. It was the most like a Kiss album. Tonight you belong to me. Amazing. Um, I love uh, Take Me Away Together as one. Uh, I think that was the one with the fa with the amazing drumming by Carmine. Uh, a piece. Uh, he did some great drumming on that, the end fade of that. But Wouldn't You Like to Know Me, uh, It's All Right, so many great songs in there. And I love Gene's album too. I know a lot of people don't like it, but I loved uh, Radioactive, Burning Up a Fever. There's a song on here, um, uh, where is it? Uh, See You Tonight, third song on here. It could have been a Beatles song. It sounds like it's something straight off of Help or Hard Day's Night. Amazing song. And I, I still love this album, so I give Gene cr more credit than he gets for that album. But anyway, so I had to rebuy the reissues as well, and it comes with the posters that, that we got when we were kids from the originals. Um, beautiful box set and colored vinyl on those. So Gene's is red and Ace's is purple. I mean, uh, Paul's is purple, Ace's is blue, and Peter's is green. Uh, last couple albums here. This is the band King with a Y. Love these guys. Um, they're kind of really sludge metal, stoner metal, Sabbath. Uh, great songs, though. Great songs, great jams, great players. Uh, love these guys. Big fan. Uh, last two albums here. I'll pull them both out. First, we have uh, the last Lamb of God album. Uh, but they have a new one that just came out this week. When, when I'm filming this, I'm going to get it on vinyl as well because I love it. I love Lamb of God. This was Chris Adler's last album. Um, Chris is a great friend of mine, so you know I, I feel bad about what happened with the split, but I still really love what they're doing. I think R. Cruz is an amazing drummer as well, and the new album is beautiful. This album I really loved, uh, mainly because it was the first album they made after Randy got out of jail um, in the Czech Republic, and man, what a, what a story that is. And anyway, these guys are, to me, uh, the modern day Pantera, you know, like just best groove metal band uh, around these days, and I love everything they do. And then Leprous, um, probably one of the well, one of my favorites of the new prog scene. I, mean, I talked about Haken earlier. Haken are kind of like you know the the kings for me. But Leprous are amazing musicianship, amazing amazing players. Uh, Bard the drummer is an amazing drummer, and um, I saw them recently. Uh, I saw them with Between the Barry to Me, and I've seen I've seen them play a few bunch of times. And just great, great musicians. Very, very dynamic. They're almost like a prog, ver kind of a prog, hard rock version of Radiohead, if you can kind of picture that. 
So anyway, there we go. That is row number three, episode number three, F through L. Uh, covered a lot of ground there. I hope I didn't put you to sleep. Uh, I hope I got all my facts straight. I'm always on the spot, like doing these, uh, you know, off the top of my head. I don't preconceive or think of anything. So hope all of the facts are correct. But uh, in any case, I hope there's stuff in here that maybe you never heard before. And now you can go check it out and uh, explore your horizons and listen to lots of different stuff because there's so much great music out there. So until the next episode, uh, stay happy, stay healthy, keep listening, and I'll see you soon. Red rum! Red rum! <laughs>